1,000 the better stories. You're listening to 1,000 Better Stories, the Scottish Communities Climate Action Network's podcast sharing stories of community-led climate action in Scotland to help us all imagine the better and fairer future and transform what we think is possible. Welcome to our Everyday Changemakers series. We blethers with everyday people taking climate action in their communities. Hello, it's Kashka, one of your story weavers. Today's guest is Carolyn Powell from the Huntley Development Trust. She's been involved in a redevelopment of an iconic listed building in Huntley's main square. The number 30, as it's affectionately known, is being transformed into a multi-purpose community space with green credentials. This project is a cornerstone of the Trust's investment into community-driven regeneration of the town centre. I caught up with Carolyn at Stirling at the May gathering for the Climate Action Towns project, supported by Architecture and Design Scotland. She was one of the presenters in an aspirational showcase of towns taking a place-based approach to issues facing communities locally, including the climate emergency. I started by asking her to describe the building she's been working on. The building is in the middle of the town square and what's wonderful about it is it's slightly magical. It has a tower at one end and albeit that tower is not hollow, there's something about it that's reminiscent of a a castle and you can imagine children making up stories about it and it's on the corner overlook, you know, right overlooking the square so as you come into the town that's what you see. So it makes the setting for something magical that's going to happen and hopefully with its renovation, something magical will happen. I'm Carolyn Powell. I work for Huntley Development Trust and I'm Town Centre Development Manager. I work in Huntley, but I live on the coast, um, just 20 miles away, half an hour from Huntley. How did you get involved in community action? What's your journey? I come from a semi-commercial background, but um, around about 2006, um, I began working for the New Economics Foundation and the interest that I'd had in regeneration uh, was fueled, and I started working on different projects for them. One in particular, uh, which was about was really a ground up approach to um, entrepreneurship. So, people in places actually turning their interests and their passions into a, into work, into a job, and supporting them to do that. So, that's really where the drive comes from and the the understanding that in any community there are people who can change not only their own future but the collective future as well and that is primarily driven by the desire and the passion to do something. When I say place-based approach what's your first reaction to it? People. It's all about people and it must be. And if you were to explain that concept to somebody that doesn't know anything about it, how would you explain it? So we have had periods in our history where we've designed around transport and roads and how things might look rather than people. People came second, they were put into that picture. People are the picture, how they use the space. I mean, you wouldn't want a designer coming in to design your kitchen. Um, to come up with something that you, in practical terms, just simply couldn't use. And that's been what's happened in the past, in some cases. So places have not been fit for the purpose and the needs of, of the people that actually want and need them, whereas that's now being reversed. So we look at people first, and we also look at what might happen. How might we want to do this? How would we want in the future things to be different you know we might think that okay so we change this to make it more useful to people to be more purposeful but then we also build into that how we would like to build green space in the future we might not be able to do that right now but if we change the traffic flow if we have more people using 
uh, sustainable transport rather than individual transport, we might then be able to create more green spaces. So we need to think ahead with those things as well. What was the biggest challenge that your community group or your project had to overcome and what lessons you've learned from that that you can share with people? Probably the communication of it because it's there are so many strands to it. There's no single sound bite that will, you know, answer the question as to how it's been designed, how it's how it can be used in the future. Um, and the way that um, so far, and this will continue because it's obviously it's not quite finished, um, to get round that has been actually bringing people into it, even during the building process, so they can start to see, well, it's taking so long because the thing is falling down, and they could see that for themselves. And then later on it'll be, they can see the spaces. Oh, gosh, you know, we can use that space and that space, and oh, there's a staircase there, and oh, there's a lift over there. You know, and suddenly it's a real thing. But communication's quite a tricky one um, because small pieces of information invite criticism um, and yet you can have too much information where it's changing so it's very hard to keep that uh, momentum going with it. Who or what inspires you? Actually, (laughs) this is going to maybe sound a little strange, Uh, change inspires me everything is in a constant state of change and change is a good thing because you can't renew without change without change things die and that kind of resistance to it is you know it's so complex um but we need to embrace change now that's assuming all change is good but of course some change isn't necessarily um but change inspires me because it can make things happen it can stir things up it can you know it can activate and inspire and and really trigger something what is your most cherished possession his name's angus he has four legs and a tail and uh, in order to come here today for the very first time last night he went to kennels and tomorrow morning I pick him up. So, uh, yes, he is without doubt my most treasured possession. I shouldn't say a dog's a possession. If it was an actual physical thing, I don't know what it would be. But certainly there's a couple of things, handmade items from, uh, you know, children's uh, collection I probably would grab. It's just a demonstration of where they were at at that point and how you felt at that point. And sometimes physical items encapsulate that. It's about, like any memory that's connected with something tangible. Um, It just evokes the memories of that period of time. If you could imagine Huntley or the project of the centre of town um, in 10 years' time or 30 years' time, if you could just close your eyes and spend a second Mm -hmm. thinking about that. And I'll ask you for one single memory from the future that you could share with us about this place. So I live half an hour away so I've just gone there and the first thing that I'm struck by is the number of people that are actually walking through the middle of town that's because they can because the traffic's now been diverted and it suddenly looks green so it doesn't look all grey because the buildings obviously they're greyish in colour Um, but it looks quite green because there's these trees in the centre and there's places to sit and people are chatting and there's tables and chairs outside number 30 and there's tables and chairs outside the bookshop and people are sitting and they're chatting, older people are chatting to young people. The youngsters are coming through from school but instead of um, heading straight down to get you know, different types of hot food. They're stopping to say hello to people in the town, not just in their groups. And they're going into different places. Um, and they look cheerful. Um, and there's a feeling of excitement. It sounds chattery busy, but not um, bus driving through the middle busy. Um, so it's quite a different feel. There are some rather lovely smells because um, there's the smell coming from the Lovely Bank restaurant, which now exists, um, and there's different smells coming out of number 30, and in the corner there's some, somebody's baking bread somewhere, 
Um, and there's notices about things that are happening um, that people are being invited to. So, yeah, I don't need to shut my eyes for that one. That's Does real. It, is there anything else that you'd like to share with um, 1,000 Better Stories podcast listeners? It's not an easy thing, um, and people can give up because it is tough. Um, and, we, you know, make no bones about it. Um, but I think the most important thing is is don't lose sight of these dreams. And, you know, if there was a criticism of the way we've all been in the past, it's not that we've been over-ambitious and failed. We haven't been ambitious enough. Be really, really, really ambitious. What have you got to lose? Just do it. Check out an excellent blog on Huntley's Development Trust's website for more stories about Number 30 and other wonderful work they're doing to make their town better for everyone. And if you're interested in finding out more about the nine towns involved in Climate Action Towns Project, I highly recommend the short film by Birken Birol, which is available on ANDS YouTube channel. I've put the links in the show notes for you. As you might have noticed, Everyday Changemakers is a new format we've introduced for 1000 Better Stories podcast to help us showcase more of the amazing work done by communities across Scotland and show that everyone can make a difference. Let us know if you'd like to share a story of a changemaker in your own community and we'll arrange for an interview with one of our field reporters. Or maybe you would like to interview someone yourself. We're planning training in audio recording and editing soon. If you're interested, get in touch with me on stories at scan.scot. Until next time, keep making a difference out there. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and share it with others. It'll really help us reach a wider audience. If something exciting is happening in your own community, be sure to let us know so that we can help you tell your own story. You can drop our story weavers a line at stories at scan.scot. It's scan, S-C-C-A-N, dot scot, S-C-O-T. We also offer training and mini-grant support to community storytellers. To keep up to date with our offerings and everything SCAN, check out our website at scan.scot or find us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram or simply sign up to the newsletter.